started. Um, when we stopped off last Tuesday night, guys, we were talking about, we were still in no bread, in the house of bread. We started talking about you have not because you, because really pretty much because you, you never really asked. But I ended up telling the people with this book and in this season, it's not about always asking for the things. It's about asking for the presence of God even the more. And, and I know when we read this book, you know, of course, we there are things that people need, you know, but as we're going into chapter three, there's got to be more rediscovering and manifested presence of God. Um, and I think we left off when I said uh, God is not talking about how how much money you want, how much, um, you know, how, whether you want the houses, whether you want the cars or gifts and all of that. He's saying, do we really want a manifested presence of his, of, of him? Do we really want a God encounter with him? Because I believe in my heart that when we truly want that, everything else would just follow suit. Amen. Do anybody disagree with what I just said? Okay, so as we're moving forward, good to see you, daughter Helen. I didn't see you bounce up there until just then. Um, so as we're moving forward, guys, um, there's got to be more. And for those that are with us for the first time that we may not be able to see you, but you see us, we are coming from, um, okay, she's coming in twice, The God Chasers book by Tommy Tenney. Um, and I know a lot of you, yeah, let her back in. She may be at work where she had to switch over. I know a lot of you have probably read this book before. But as you as you're going through the, the this word empowerment Bible study with us, try not to look at it as if I read it before, so there's nothing else it can speak to me. Try to look at it with an open mind of saying, God, I need you to speak to me while we're going through this this this, this particular um, series on the God Chaser. Okay, so I because I believe if we do that we'll be able to even get more of, even along with what we already got in the past. Amen. So uh, anytime something is, re has someone comes back and they repeat something, I'm to a place now I'm saying, okay, Lord, I want to be able to hear all that, hear all that you have for me, receive all that you have for me. So I'm gonna go in with an open mind, with a clear heart so that I'm not missing anything. So with that in mind, um, like I said, the, the, uh, there's got to be more rediscovering the manifest presence of God. So who wants to start reading? I guess it's going to be Pastor Vicky. Nobody's moving. I'm sorry, Pastor Vicky. You read all day, don't you? <laughs> it's all good. I can, as long as I can talk, I can still make a joyful noise. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, chapter three, there's got to be more rediscovering the manifest presence of God. I don't know about you, my friend, but there's a driving passion in my heart that whispers to me that there's more than what I already know, more than what I already have. It makes me jealous of John who wrote Revelation. It makes me envious of people who get glimpse out of this world into that world and see things that I only dream about. I know there's more. One reason I know there's more is because of those who have encountered the more and were never the same. God chasers. My prayer is I want to see you like John saw you. In all my reading and study of the Bible, I have never found any person mentioned in the scriptures who really had a God encounter and then backslid and rebelled against God. Once you experience God, once you experience God in his glory, you can't turn away from him or forget his touch. It's not just an argument or a doctrine, it's an experience. That is why the Apostle Paul said, I know whom I have believed, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Unfortunately, many people in the church will say, I know about whom I have believed. That means they haven't met him in his glory. Just want to add, just want to i mean on two things right quick in that first paragraph i i have underlined from a while back there's more than what i already know more than what i already have 
And this is talking about what I already know of God and what I already have of God, because that lets me know there's still got to be more. There's got to be more. And then on the, the at the bottom of that same paragraph, it says more and more and were never the same. So most people, when they encountered the more, they were never the same. And, you know, I have to be careful when I say certain things. Well, haven't you all ever looked at people and, and, and they say that they're changed? Somebody started singing a song the other day. I, I don't remember where I was at graduation or wherever. They were saying, I looked at my hands and my hands was new. And I'm going somewhere. They looked at my feet and my feet was you. Y'all know people sing that song. And I said to myself, okay. When you got saved, when you looked at your hands, did your hands really look new? But with that in mind, thank you. But with that really in mind, when we have a, a true encounter with God over and over and over again, we look different. We feel different. We act different. We talk different. We walk different. So when we see people and it doesn't seem like there's been change, it's not that we're judging, but we're like, wait a minute, if you are having the same type of God encounter that I'm having, or if you're wanting the same type of God encounter that I'm having, well then guess what? People should see something different. Why? I mean, I'm gonna get my last two comments and then MIT is gonna, I mean, Minister Bonnie is gonna tell me why she smiled like that. And that next paragraph, it talks about, um, um, talks about uh, when when people talk about having an encounter, um, they won't backslide. When people have a really a truly encounter with God, they won't keep you know. And I know this might sound crazy, doing the same old stuff. Somebody said to me recently, "You don't understand. Sometimes it's hard for some of us to get delivered from some things and other people." And I said, "When you truly have a God encounter, you won't." Y'all get what I'm saying? When I, when I when I had a, a true God encounter, when I was trying to stop the drinking and the drugging and all of that other stuff, I said, God, shift my life. I've, I've never turned back. I've never looked back. I've never longed to go back. So if we truly have a true God encounter and discover his presence and, and all that he is to, to in our lives, tell me, should things be the same? Now, Minister Bonnie, tell me why you why you look the way you just look. I'm gonna leave that why I look where I look alone. I'm not gonna tell you why I look where I look. <laughs> it's been one of those days, but I'm okay, here. But I mean, I didn't know if you wanted to comment on what I said. No, uh, I mean to be to be transparent. You do uh, once you at once you have a truly God experience. I mean, truly, that's a hunger that you always chase after. You always want to ha be in his presence again. It's, you know, for me, I have, you know, that very first time that I ever experienced his presence like that, the girl came in and was like, hey, I need your, I need your money. I was working in the book. So she's like, I need your money to, to deposit. I was like, girl, <laughs> Need to leave me alone. I'm still basking in God's presence. You talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you you never forget that. You never forget that, and you also you never forget what people say. Oh God, Gary, you look different. You 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 look different, and and you and you remember the times when you really know you're different. You know that uh, you truly forgive people. You know where people have hurt you and and did things like that and. And you can wind up being friends with them, I mean, and befriending them and things like that. I mean, that's a God encounter that, you, you know, he changes you from the inside. And yes. you always long, you long for that because the world beats on us. It, it, it has a tendency of beating us, beating us day by day. And we can um, fall short. I won't say slip. I, I'm not going to say go back. But we can fall short. But you always remember. I mean, I always remember how good he has been and the things that he has delivered me from and and that it has to be more. I mean, I'm just dreaming about the more because you have to press. You have to continue to press and continue to press. Tonight, I said, this is what I said before I got on the call. I said, God, don't tell me, but I don't feel like it today. I don't feel like blessing you today. I don't have a whole lot of people that I don't have to love on today. The day is just not the day, boss. So what you gonna do? And I got my foot on this car. 
Because, <laughs> you know, I mean, he's not going to ever tell us that. He, he know, he don't carry, I don't carry too many loads today, body. I don't have time to hear you pray, you know. So, you know, it's like, here, get on on this God, God chase. <laughs> amen, amen. Because I think we were all tired, and I was like, Pastor Vicky, I said, but I we couldn't cancel. But that's why I love the part that he says he's never met anyone that had a true God encounter, but then they backslid or they rebelled against God. Because when you truly have a true encounter, there's no way you're going back. Yeah, you you know you might think, but you won't go. You might think, but you won't revert back to the old ways. Anybody else want to comment on that before she continue reading? I just want to add that when you truly have that that encounter, you're, the way you feel completely changed. It's like a weight has been lifted off of you, and yes. and 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 now now you know that there truly is hope, and that you have an opportunity now to tap into something that's going to make you feel this natural high all the time, as long as you are pressing. Uh, but then if you if but the backsliders, the ones who backslide. I can't say that they truly had an encounter because when you backslide, you don't have that feeling. You don't feel that way. You feel like, okay, this is my last resort. All right, this is what's going to make me feel good. Oh, I'm going to do this anyway, although I know I'm not supposed to do it. But when you have that encounter, you don't have those same feelings. Those feelings that you have completely change. Amen. Amen. That's true. Anybody else? Good to see you, Mother Forbes. Um. I was one of those teenagers who would basically, basically, basically what we did, like we just laughed at them holy rollers. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but my grandmother, she was one of them. Um, <laughs> but I can remember being invited to a friend's church. Uh, she told me that they were having a revival. And so I went there expecting to, re just expecting to have a revival, but the visiting pastor consulted with her pastor and they had an actual prayer meeting. Uh, and I can remember there were people who were being called up and um, the pastor was a prophet and he was speaking over people's lives. And he, it seemed like he was calling out people like all around me to the front, to in, behind me, to the left, to the right. And I had the thought like, pass me not father, please. Mm -hmm. And then he called me up front and all I can remember, it just felt like God put his arms around me and let me know how much he loved me. Uh, there's nothing to substitute that. There's nothing to substitute that feeling, that experience um, for all the times that I grew up in church and, and I knew God. I felt like Job, when Job said to God, let me see, like, I, what is it? I'm trying to remember. Uh, when Job told God that he had heard about him, but now he knows him. So it made me more and more hungry to learn more about him and to grow in relationship with him. Amen. But you said something that I got to not correct, but say, because we don't have to be a holy roller <laughs> to have a God encounter. I had to say that because you said all those holy rollers <laughs> people. I had to say that we don't have to be holy rollers to 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 want the more of His presence. You know, I wake up saying, "God, I just want to feel Your presence." I mean, I know He's already mm -hmm. there, but I'm just letting Him know, God, I just want You to. I I need I need Your presence right now. I need I need an encounter with You every day. It's every not day. just a it's not just a Sunday morning thing. It's not just a prayer call thing. It should be an everyday thing. Every morning I get up saying, God, wrap me in your arms. Mm -hmm. I want to walk with you. You know, we sing that song, walk with me, Lord, walk with me. But God is saying, how about you walk with me? <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So, so yeah, I, but I just had to say that, baby, because most people would think only holy rollers get have a God encounter. And that's not, that, and that ain't true. You know, a whole lot of saints back then, they, they might have been holy rollers and they might not have had no kind of no kind of presence of the Lord in their life. 
They might have just been going to church. Okay, let me move. We read, baby, so I don't get in no trouble. I was just thinking, God saying, walk with me, but how about let me lead? <laughs> yeah, hey, amen, that too. <laughs> amen. Okay, one reason people fl um, flow out the back doors of our churches as fast as they come in through the front door is because they have more of a man encounter with mm. our programs than a God encounter with the unforgettable majesty, uh, majesty and power of the almighty God. Yes. What is needed are Damascus roads and experiences like Saul's encounter with God himself. Mm. This speaks strongly of the difference between the omnipresence of God and the manifest presence of God. The phrase omnipresence of God refers to the fact that he is everywhere all the time. He is that particle in the atomic nucleus that nucleus physics um, cannot see and can only track. The Gospel of John touches, uh, touches on this quality of God when it says, and without him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1 verses 3b. God is everywhere in everything. He is the composite of everything, both the glue that holds the pieces of the universe together and the pieces themselves. This explains why people can sit on a bar stool in an embrid in 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 help me out, please. I, I know what that word is. I gotta find my spot. Tell me where you are. I'm sorry. Inebriated. Yes. In Say it again. Oh. Inebriated. Thank you. I need more coffee. In an inebriated state and suddenly feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit without the benefit of a preacher, gospel music, or any other Christian influence. God is literally right there in the bar with them and the mind numbling of um, ability of alcohol to lower inhibitions also allows them to lose their inhibitions toward God. Unfortunately, by then, it is not always a choice of their will that moves them toward God, just the hunger of their hearts. Their mind is numb, their heart is hungry. When their mind recovers a, to discover the will is unbroken, they often revert because it was not a valid encounter. A hungry heart inside a man without an unbowed head mind and an unbroken unsubmitted will is a recipe for misery now if god can do that in the bar room why should we be surprised at all the other things he can do all by himself most people who don't come from a church background will tell you that the first time they felt the prick of conviction of god was in some other place than in a church service or religious setting all these instances illustrate the effects of the omnipresence of God, the quality of his presence being everywhere all the time. Amen. I just wanted to say, because I was trying to figure out where you were, my page had, had flipped over. When 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 we have got uh, when we have God's manifested presence, we're he's revealing himself to us. And that's a difference than just being in his presence. You know, why be in his presence and not allow him to to uh, reveal himself to us? When you were talking about uh, somebody being inebriated, I've been there when I was so drunk and so high, but it seemed like when the Holy Spirit moved, that high went away. It's like I got up right, and it's like I met God right there. So mm -hmm. when we want God to reveal himself to us, we don't just want to be in his presence, be in a service, and be in that service, as you said, what you we, you read earlier, more of a man encounter, but yet we don't experience him rebuilding himself to us. He's only going to do it when we want him to. And how many agree or disagree with that? Can you imagine? We can all be in the same service, but when you want God to reveal himself to you bad enough, he will, and somebody can be sitting or standing right beside you and they don't sense anything. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to comment on what I just said? Because it has it has happened. Go ahead, Pastor Vicky. I was just going to add too. So I think a lot of people get convicted by um, Christians or religious people when they are talking to someone who uh, has a has an issue like drinking or 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 something like that, and then they realize that they need to change, and then you know in the midst or in the hype of the conversation they accept christ 
but then they have not really had that encounter which is, which is why I think it's easy, easier for them to backslide, especially if you know they felt convicted at that time when someone discussed with them, this is not right. You know, Jesus died on the cross for all our sins, take it to God, um, he can help you. And then they say, okay, in, in the moment, they're like all in, but they're all in because they felt convicted, not because they actually um, had that encounter with God. And so now, since they didn't have that encounter with God, now they they're trying to do the right thing. They're trying to get in the groove of going to church and you know doing things godly things, but because they haven't had that encounter, they have fallen off the wagon, and now they're finding themselves reaching for that substance or whatever it is that that made them feel good um, back at the back at the time before they accepted Christ. So I think that might be one of the reasons why we have a lot of backsliders. Okay, but that but then it can still be said the same way when we're all in the same church meeting. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't have to be midway, you don't have to be joined, you don't have to be high. We That's can all true. be in this, we can all be in the same service and the presence of God is in the midst, but everybody don't have the same, don't have an encounter mm -hmm. because they're, they're they're there, but they're not having an encounter. But then they leave and, they, and they're like well, I don't know what the hype was because I didn't feel anything. I didn't sense anything. I didn't see anything. That's mainly because they didn't go in with an expectation of having a God encounter. Mm -hmm. What do y'all think? Yep, I agree. Because I, I mean, I've been, I've been there. I've been there. I've been to church many times and years ago. I'm just going to church because I'm supposed to go. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Minister Bonnie. That's that's what I was going to say. We, we close, uh, not we, but... Um, yeah, we we could people, yeah, people uh can close themselves off to uh the presence of God. Um and when we when we don't know how to hear from God, you know, we've we studied on different books how to hear from God. And when you as a uh, as a believer, a Christian, you really don't know how to hear from God, you expect him to move the same way all the time. And he he doesn't necessarily have to. So you could be in, like you said, in the service, you could be there. Y your heart may not be there, you know, and, and that's what connects with God is, is our heart. And when our heart connects with him, then, then he knows that we're hungry after him. So if you go into the service and you're just there because somebody invited you, you really, you just, you really didn't want to go or you, you're really not looking for God. You're really not looking for God. You come into to the, service to see what are they doing okay what, what's what's the big deal of what they're having tonight instead of god i'm coming to see you god i'm coming to to have an experience with you, you right know? it's like you yeah. said you they didn't come looking for god they came just for whatever reason but they really didn't come looking for god right because a lot of people do go to church because this is what you're supposed to do on sundays yeah you know, they could have been in church all their life, but something is blocking that encounter. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and people will blame it on other people. But, but when, in reality, we got to look at us. You know, good to see you, uh, Pastor Marilyn Womack, Elder Marilyn. Uh, good to see you guys. So, um, so, so we block what we, what, we, what we need. So we have to look at what causes people to block that presence, block that encounter, you know, and with that in mind, that's why um, no matter what, I think one time I went to church, I forget where I went. And uh, so anyway, I said, Lord, um, when I found out who was going to be preaching, I wanted to turn around and leave. And the Lord said, sit down. It's not about who's ministering. Did you come to meet me or did you come to meet them? Mm -hmm. and, and I never forgot that day. And as I sat there, the Lord began to minister to me because I took the block away and I was able to receive. Had I not allowed him to take the block, uh, if I had not taken the block away because the Lord don't put the block, we put the block up. Mm -hmm. We put the wall up. And if I had not allowed him, you know, to, to, to move in me so that I would remove the block then guess what? I never would have received anything that night when I was in that service. Mm -hmm. So my thing is, uh, we're all reading the same book and many people have read it many of times. Like I said, I've had it since the first one, the first thing came out. 
but I've read it so many times, but when I first got it, did I want a God encounter? You know, I mean, because I've had this book for a long time. I'm trying to remember. It came out in 98. Um, I think, yeah, that's when it came out in 98. So I've had this book all that time. And all those years prior to that, I thought I had had a God encounter and I was pastoring. But I realized after reading this book, there was something missing. And it was me. It wasn't the people. Yeah. They weren't. They weren't keeping me from that. That the presence of God. It was me. It, it was me. So we've got to. We've got to get to a place to say, Lord, I got to have more of Your presence. Reveal Yourself to me. My heart is open to be to receive from You, no matter what. And I believe in my heart, things will change, and people won't go to church the same way. They will not hear the Word the same way. They won't even open their Bible to read the Word the same way. Mm. Mm -hmm. Y'all get what I'm saying? Because you can mm -hmm. read the word. And if you mm -hmm. just read the word, because you're supposed to read your word every morning, you think you're going to have a God encounter because you're reading the word? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Because you're not asking him to speak to you through his word. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying you in, as, as us, I'm just saying in general. But mm -hmm. people, if people don't ask God to speak to them through the word, they're just reading the word because this is I got to do my daily devotion. I got to read these scriptures. I got to read this, this. I got to go do this. But yet, they're not coming for more, okay? They're, because we're just doing. Anybody just want to comment? I know I'm talking a lot, but <laughs> Pastor Vicky, were you getting ready to say something? You ready? To no, read? you've you've already you've already said the two key words that I was thinking: expectations when you're there, and to take down the defensive block and allow him to um, speak to you and to um, minister to you. Yeah. Yeah. I would say um, we have to humble ourselves before him mm -hmm. in his presence, mm -hmm. um, because sometimes um, we can even in even in morning devotion and even in morning prayer, we can we can go in with the um, intent of, yeah, this is what I need to do. But you can wake up one morning and you, you know, that's what you need to do. But, you know, sometimes we put that foot on the wrong foot that foot hit the wrong side and and you'd have to sit there i mean me i'll say me i have to sit there some mornings and just i can't even say anything i just i know that i need to be in his presence because i have to start my day with mm -hmm. him and because if i don't it's 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 not that my day is going to be so bad it's i haven't grounded myself in him so that he could settle settle anything that's that's you know edging at me or or trying to disturb my peace you know so i have to come to him in the mornings and and ask for that dose of peace again ask for that you know ask for that dose of of strength again because if i don't i'll be a weakling that day mm -hmm. and and you know i'll still love god that day but will i be walking in in the in the fullness of who I need to be that day. So we need a we need a like you said a God encounter every day. But sometimes we don't wake up raring to go. Some mornings you wake up raring to go than others, you know. But I, some morning I just have to sit there and when I sit there I just he eventually is like okay baby you know what you want to do this morning you know I'm just like I just want to cry this morning God I just want to cry and you know and. And, and then eventually, once I humble myself, then I can go into my prayer because I'm I'm he's he's removed that burden that I woke up with. So, but anyway. But 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 at least you went in with an expectation of meeting God there. Someone said to me about maybe about a month ago. I don't know why all this stuff happened to me throughout the day. I read my Bible and 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 I'm thinking about it now. Holy Spirit just brought it back to my remembrance. They read their Bible. That's all they did was read their Bible. Mm -hmm. They did they didn't they didn't have devotion with God. They didn't have a, a, mm -hmm. a an encounter with Him that morning. They just read their Bible. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling that young lady, I said, "Baby, if you get up and you rushing just to read your Bible to say you read your Bible." You didn't even get in God's presence. You just read because you know somebody say you're supposed to read every day. Mm -hmm. You know, so I just thought about that. So when we when we wake up, we gotta want to have that encounter. You know, you gotta give some extra time if you got to to have that encounter to for, for, so God can just reveal Himself to you or, or speak to you for that day. 
So if we just go in just to say, I read my word, then you just read your word. <laughs> Anybody else want to comment? Good to see you, Deaconess. <laughs> oh, boy. Why are you laughing, Pastor Vicky? Because uh, that is more than some people do. <laughs> so <laughs> I got to give her a little bit of credit. <laughs> But if, oh yeah, but but this no this I when this person said it to me, they said, "Well, I was told I'm supposed to read every morning, so that's what I'm doing." <laughs> do you remember like, what you so read? The attitude, yeah. Yeah, but do you remember what you read? Did it rest mm. upon your heart? Did yeah. you? You get what I'm saying? Did you? I, did you? I, I, I got I got what you I got what you said, but I had to chuckle because at least they were reading the Bible. So people I know, don't even do that. I know, but but I told the person if you truly want to encounter with God, you got to do more than just read. Yes, I agree. God, Amen. I want God to speak to you through His Word. Okay. Amen. Anybody else? Okay, we're on page thirty six for those who have the book or you just joined in with us. Um, go ahead, Pastor Vicky. If anybody else want to pick up, or if not, she gonna keep on reading. Okay, go okay. ahead. Okay, the manifest presence of God. Yeah, even though God is everywhere all the time, there are also times when He concentrates, <sighs> consecrates the very essence of His being into what many call the manifest presence of God. When this happens, there is a strong sense and awareness that God Himself has entered the room. You might say that although he is indeed everywhere all the time, there are also specific periods of time when he is here more than there. For divine reason, God chooses to consecrate or reveal himself more strongly in one place than another or more at one time than another. This concept may disturb you theologically. You may be thinking, wait a minute, God is always here. He is omnipresent. That's true, but why did he say, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, see 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, chapter 7, verse 14. If they are already his people, what other level of him are they to seek? Hmm. Seek his face? Why? It is, it is because his favor flows wherever his face is directed. You can be God's child and not have his favor, much as an earthly child could be in disfavor, but not be disowned. That phrase in the verse is particularly interesting. God told his people for all generations that if they would seek his face and turn from their wicked ways, then he would hear them and heal their land. How can we be God's people and have wicked ways? Perhaps our wicked ways explained why we have been content just to be in God's vicinity instead of gazing upon his face. The only thing that is going to turn the focus in favor of God towards us is our hunger. We must repent, reach for his face and pray. God look at us and we'll look to you. Hmm. I only had two things on that part uh, where you you said about uh, enter the, where he entered the room. There's a song that, they, that talks about it's in the room. I don't know who it's by, but it's in the room. And a lot of times we can be in a room, in a sanctuary, in our prayer closet. And what we need is there. But if we're not looking for God, we're just in the room. Okay. And then the part about um, uh, for divine reasons, God chooses to, to, to um, concentrate or reveal himself more strongly in a place in one place than another but at the same time yes it could be but then at the same time it's still depending on the people it's still dependent upon the people mm -hmm. uh because you can be in the midst of that what was it that a susus revival that was going on and even with that everybody didn't get everything that they needed they were in there with the people but they still everybody still didn't get everything they needed why could it be that they was just there Okay. Um, the part that says you can, you can, you can be God's child and not have His favor. That's something, isn't it? Most people think just because they're a child of God, they can have His favor. Not, that ain't always the case. You see, Elder Maryland, that is not always the case. Just because you're God's child, don't mean you can always have His favor. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to comment on anything she just read with the manifest presence of God? 
You know, when I read that part about the only thing that is going to turn the focus in favor of God towards us is our hunger. You know, I was thinking that, you know, we get we get this we get to decide how close we want him to get to us. That's we it. got to have the hunger. And so when we turn on that hunger, I believe he he honors that and he actually um, embraces us more and he actually expose himself more. But it just reading that it told that tells me we get to decide yeah. how close we want to get it to him based on our hunger. Mm -hmm. well, that's what we were talking about with the buffet a uh, week before last. You can go to a buffet and if you're not really hungry, why go to the buffet? You know, it's too much on the buffet. However, but if you eat something, you're not satisfied, you go get something else. And I think it's the same way it is with, with, with the things of God. Sometimes people get in God's presence, but then they, they're like, well, this is not really what I want. Let me try something else. Let me try something else. But so, because they're never satisfied, that that hunger. Now, me personally, I'm, I'm in a season I'm not satisfied because there's more that I want. But that's, you know, that's where all of us should be. We should never, ever get to a place that we're satisfied. We should never get to a place that we're just straight up satisfied. Okay, anybody else want to comment on anything she just read? <clears throat> okay, read on my child. Guided by the eye of God. Too often God's people can be guided only by the written word or the prophetic word. The Bible says he wants us to move beyond that to a place marked by a greater degree of tenderness of heart toward him and by a deeper maturity that allows him to guide us with his eyes. See Psalms 32 verses 8 through 9. In the kind of home in which I was raised, my mom or dad. I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me. Can somebody read that Psalm 32 verse 8 and 9 right quick, please? Anybody have their Bibles close by or open? And while you, you guys are finding it, Pastor, Pastor Womack says, I'm not satisfied because I know there's more. Amen. <clears throat> Anybody have it? Have it Psalm 32 verse 8 and 9? Google it. Okay. This, is the, this is the New Living Translation version. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life, and I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and brittle to keep it under control. Oh, you know what? Yep, that was 32. Eight and okay. nine. Mm -hmm. Y'all catch that senseless, senseless. Read that, that part one more time. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and brittle to keep it under control. Did y'all catch that? The Holy Spirit will keep us in that space, but we've got to get to a place that we want to be guided by God's eyes, by the eyes of God. We don't have to be senseless in what we want or, or, or be like the horse where they got to beat it to go this way, beat it to go that way, or pull it to go that way. When we are guided by God's eyes, then guess what? We're going to follow him intently. We, we're not going to be straying to the point that we got to be beat back into reality. I know that's a bad way of saying it, but but y'all catch that. Mm -hmm. So the part that she says that he, he wants us to, he wants us to, to move beyond that, that to a place marked by a greater degree of tenderness of heart towards him and by a deeper maturity that allows him to guide us. Because when we, if we're not mature, he can't guide us because we won't let him. And I, I believe sometimes the saints, I can't talk about the other folks. I believe sometimes the saints can be so immature that even if God wanted to lead them, he, he probably can't because when you when, when we're immature we won't allow him to lead us but so far you know that we sing that song lead me guide me along the way lord if you lead me i will not stray y'all remember that old song some of y'all might not know that song but 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 we got to get to a place as we grow we want we want god to lead us no matter what we want him to guide us no matter what so that we won't miss anything that he wants to show us spiritually or otherwise anybody want to comment on what i just said right quick i know i stopped her midway but go ahead i just, I just uh -huh. want to just mention the part the part where where it talks about the heart the tenderness of your heart yes you know i mean a hard-hearted person 
it's mm. it's hard for you to it's hard for you to get along with people. So you know it's it's hard to allow God to lead you. Ooh, you know, good. so so the so the tenderness of your heart that allows him, you know, because if you, the tenderness of your heart, you think about, oh wow, this this isn't pleasing to God. Oh wow, this is offensive to God. That's tenderness of your heart, you know, and 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 that allows you to know what he's saying. Hey, I want you to go this way. I don't I don't want you to be like that. I want you to be like that. So that's a guiding, you know. So that tenderness of heart, man, that's yeah yes yes okay pastor vicky i'm gonna try my best to not to talk until you finish this this section right quick i'm gonna try all right in the kind of home in which i was raised my mom or dad could just look at me a certain way and get the job done if i was straying down the path of childhood foolishness they didn't always have to say anything just a look in their eyes as they glance or glare toward me would give me the guidance that i needed do you still need to hear a thundering voice from behind the pulpit, a biting prophetic utterance to correct your ways, or are you able to read the emotion of God on his face? Are you tenderhearted enough that his eye can guide you and convict your heart of sin? When he glances your way, are you quick to say, oh, I can't do that. I can't go there. And I can't say that because it would displease my father. The glance of God convicted Peter and to the altar music of a rooster crowing, he wept his way to tenderness. God is everywhere, but he doesn't turn his face and his favor everywhere. That is why he tells us to seek his face. Yes, he is present with you every time you meet with other believers in a worship service. But how long has it been since your hunger caused you to crawl up in his lap? And like a child to reach up and take the face of God to turn it towards you. Intimacy with him. That is what God desires. And his face should be our highest focus. The Israelites referred to the manifest presence of God as the Shekinah glory of God. When David began to talk about bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, he wasn't interested in the gold covered box with the artifacts inside it. He wasn't interested in the blue flame that hovered between the out, outer stretch wings of the cherubim on top of the ark. That is what he wanted because there was something about the flame that signified that God himself was present. And wherever that glory or manifest presence of God went, there was victory, power, and blessings. Intimacy will bring about blessings, but the pursuit of blessings won't always bring about intimacy. Mm. What we cry for is a restoration of the manifest presence of God. When Moses was exposed to the glory of God, the residue of that glory caused his face to shine so much that he came back down from the mountain. The people said, Moses, you must cover your face. We can't bear to look at you. See Exodus 34 verses 29 through 35. Whatever or whoever is exposed to the manifest presence of God begins to absorb the very material matter of God. Can you imagine what it was like in the Holy of Holies? How much of the glory of God can be absorbed by those badger skins and the veil and the ark itself? Okay. Whew. I only got three things. She said, how long has it been since you hunger? Okay, let me go past that one. Um, when he talked about David, David wasn't interested in the covered box, the artifacts that was inside of it. He was interested in the flame. When we were packing up to move and uh, uh, Sister Pastor Cousins had came over and they were helping us pack up, the guy asked me what was up there and I told him it was the Ark of the Covenant. He said, do you have things in it that was in the Ark? And I said, yes, we do. You know, and he said, really? So when I opened it and he looked inside, he said, wow, most people just have an empty box, you know, but I thought about that when I, when I read this, it's not about a Ark of the Cup, a replica of that Ark of the Covenant sitting anywhere. That's just a replica. It's about the flame. Is it still burning? It's not even about the things inside. What about the flame? Is it still burning? And the part that she said about, uh, the pursuit of when people when people pursue blessings instead of the presence of God 
it won't matter how much they get, they still will be missing something. So we got to make sure we don't pursue the blessings and pursue God. In the midst of us pursuing God, he'll bless us however he fit, see fit to bless us. Okay, the last part I had up here was um, we can't bear to look, uh, they were saying they couldn't bear to look at Moses. And then she went on to say whatever or whoever is exposed to the manifested presence of God, of God begins to absorb the very material matter of God. Um, as we read this, we have to we have to understand that, um, as I said at the beginning, we can all be in a group of people. And just because it doesn't look like God's presence is there, may not be there for you, but his presence could be there for someone else. OK, so we have to make sure we get to a place to go after God for ourselves not for the group that's around you you know not for the group that's around you i think that's where like i said earlier that's where the problem comes in at people are saying well it doesn't look like anything happened well it might not have looked like anything happened for you but you don't know what that other individuals may have might have felt or might have how god moved upon their lives uh i just wanted to call those those few things out anybody else want to comment on what she just read Got it by the eye of God. No. Okay. Let's see. It is 751. Let's see if we can do the legacy. When God begins to visit in a place or among a people, unusual things start happening simply because he is there. If you don't believe me, ask Jacob. Look particularly at his flight from his problems. At one point, God told him to go back to Bethel meaning house of God, and Jacob essentially told his family members, if we can just get back to Bethel, I'll build an altar to God and we'll be all right. See Genesis chapter 35 verses 1 through 3. He knew there was a lingering presence of God at Bethel. It is interesting to read what happened when Jacob and his family made that trip to Bethel, and they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were around, around about them. And they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob, Genesis chapter 35, verse 5. The Hebrew word for terror comes from a root word that means to prostrate, hence to break down, hence by break down either by balance or by confusion and fear. If we want the fear of the Lord to return to the world, then the church must return to Bethel, the place of his manifest presence. Amen. So it's not looking at, we don't have to look at an actual place because none of us are probably, I mean, I've been overseas, but might not ever be able to go there, but get back to where God is, get back to where his presence is, get back to where his lingering presence is. Okay. So that's, 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 that doesn't have to be a place. It doesn't have to be a city. Okay. It doesn't have to be a church. Get back into his presence. Okay. Anybody want to comment on that? I don't think we're going to make stumbling in the cloud. You can try because that part, that, that, that part right by itself, uh, that place of where he, his presence lingers. Okay. Go ahead, Pastor. The, the manifest presence of God often lingers in a place, even when no one else is around. I remember the day a member of the church staff at a church that God invaded across the platform in the sanctuary on a weekday to refresh the platform water. He never made it back. Three, hour, three hours later, somebody noticed that he was gone and they went looking for him. The light was dim in the sanctuary and when they turned on the lights, they saw the man lying prostrate on the platform where he had fallen after stumbling into the cloud of his presence. There had been times when a cloud of the presence of God would suddenly show up as God's people worship. Now that is when things get scary. It could be the mist of the glory of God beginning to congeal itself before our eyes. I don't understand it. I'm just telling you it has happened. One of the pastors there had a brother-in-law who was an atheist. In fact, he wasn't just an atheist. He was a e evangelistic atheist. This brother-in-law was the kind of guy who you wanted to avoid at family gatherings because he always caused trouble and started heated arguments. In the middle of God's invasion of this particular church, this brother-in-law called the pastor's wife, who was his sister. He told her, look, I'm flying in. Would you pick me up? I would just want to spend a couple of days with you. 
The pastor knew something was up because this brother-in-law had never done that before. When he arrived, it was obvious that he didn't know what he was doing there. It was the strangest thing. There they were trying to make conversation with each other when they had nothing in common. They talked about the weather and then they ran in, ran into one of those awkward long silences in the car coming back from the airport. As they passed by the church, the pastor said, that's the church, we just finished some remodeling. Since the brother-in-law had never seen it and figured it was yet another way to pl uh, plug an awkward moment of silence, this pastor said, you wouldn't want to go in and look at it, would you? To mm -hmm. his complete surprise, his atheist brother-in-law said, yes, I would. Mm. Now, go on and read the next part. I'm not ready for this. The pastor pulled into the church parking lot and then unlocked the door to the church building. His brother-in-law was right behind him and the pastor's wife was third in line. The pastor stepped inside and held the door open for his brother-in-law. And the moment the man's foot touched the floor on the other side of the threshold, he crumbled in a heap and began to weep and cry out, my God, help me. I'm not ready for this. I don't know how to do this. What am I going to do? Then he grabbed the pastor and said, tell me how to get saved right now. The whole time he was reeling on the floor and crying uncontrollably. So this pastor led his brother-in-law to the Lord right there while he was sprawled half in half out of the building while his sister patiently held the door open. Her atheist brother had an encounter with the residue of lingering presence of the glory of God. As soon as he regained a measure of coherence, they asked him, what happened to you? He said, I don't know how to explain it. And I know, all I know is that when I was outside the building, I was an atheist and I didn't believe that God existed. But when I stepped across that threshold, I met him and I knew it was God. I knew I had to get right and I felt horrible about my life. Then he added, it just took all the strength out of me. What could happen in a city or religion if this strength of presence expanded beyond the localized area of the church building? Okay, uh, you, what could happen um, or in a region? Okay, I wanna go back up right quick to where the legacy of place we were talking about, they were saying, go back to Bethel. I remember, I just looked at Deaconess and I remember and I, I've said this often <clears throat> where she said one day, Apostle, don't you remember when we were at the old church, how the, how the presence of the Lord fell? You remember that, Gina? And she, and she would say it often. And I said to her, baby, it, it wasn't about the place. It's about the people. It's about what the people wanted, how hungry they were. Back then, the pe not saying people aren't hungry now, but but the people were hungry but she had experienced something there that she wanted to see again she wanted to experience again and that's how we got to get to the to that place it's not about going to a place or going to a building look at it from from, from the inside i want to get black to back to where i first y'all remember that song, that song at the cross at the cross where i first saw the light mm -hmm. It was there by faith I received my sight and they not talking a natural sight, mm -hmm. you know, so that's where we got to get to that place where we can have that spiritual sight. Um, I wanted her to finish reading that because he was he was saying he didn't know why he needed to go. He just knew he needed to go, but it took him. It took him stepping over a threshold and it I don't even think it was the church itself. I think it was a threshold mentally, emotionally in his mind. Y'all get what I'm saying? In, in his mind to realize this is what you've been missing all of this time. You know, because about the way it said it talked about he couldn't even get halfway across the threshold where he met Jesus. He met him right there. But can you imagine? It could have he could have walked in the building, didn't feel nothing. He could have walked in a big uh one of them, what you call them big places with the big lights and all the other stuff and not feel anything. But when he stepped across, I believe in my heart, his heart, <coughs> his mind was transformed to a place where he could meet, finally meet God. Y'all talk to me. What do y'all think? I think it goes back to the tenderness of his heart, of the heart. His heart was his, he was humble towards God. He had allowed himself to humble himself and the tenderness of his heart is what allowed him to yield to the presence of God and God just met him where he was because, you know, he was, he was, he was then ready. 
And God doesn't give us things until we are ready. We can Thanks. want something so bad. We can want it so bad. But until he knows that we are really, truly ready for it, yes. he is not going to give it to us. Yes. And can you imagine all the times his brother-in-law had already talked to him on the phone? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. mentally, emotionally, he wasn't ready until right. his heart was open. Right. So that's why I said it wasn't even about the place. It was him being ready. And on that note, it's eight o'clock. There's no sense in us going around the room because that's why I kept asking, uh, as always, as we stop at each section, what y'all get from this, what y'all get from this. That's what we're going to start doing from now on. What did you get from that right there so that we don't have to literally go all the way back? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So, but where Minister Bonnie left us was perfect. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it was his heart. It wasn't, it wasn't the church, him seeing that building. It was mm -hmm. his heart. His heart was finally now ready. So I don't know about you all, but we got to get to a place that our hearts can finally now be ready for that which God wants to do for us and in us. Amen. I'm going Amen. to, okay, I've got to, uh-oh. It's not letting me stop it. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs>